Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here, very interesting discussion. Uh, so I'm from a forecasting organization, that's what we are, and it's our professional defamation always to be predicting and forecasting the future, um, not just looking at the past or the present. Um, historians look at the past, Journalists generally are looking at what is happening now in the present uh, and our remit really is to, on the basis of analysing past and present trends, to give our best forecast of what is likely to happen in future and that's what we do. Uh, I'm part of the Europe team in the country analysis division of the EIU, so you can imagine we've been pretty uh, busy. Um, in recent years. I used to think, uh, I used to cover Eastern Europe much more and I used to think, my God, how boring it would be to be covering Western Europe, but you know, that's obviously all changed um, in, in recent years. So um, the outlook for Europe in about eight minutes or 10 minutes, um, so I've got about eight to 10 minutes, so I'm not gonna talk about Brexit. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Russia or Eastern Europe or terrorism or migration or Greece or Turkey. So um, that already tells you that um, it's quite a challenging time for, for, for Europe. Um, so I'm going to tell you some things about the economic outlook. And my slides aren't working. Um, oh, it's all right. It's all right. Here they are. Okay. So I've got a few slides. Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you some things about the economic outlook, which I think is important, uh, but which I can tell you with some certainty are not going to change the political outlook in Europe uh, this year. Um, and anybody hoping that the Eurozone economic recovery is going to pull the rug from under the feet of the populist insurgent parties should think again, because that is not going to happen. Uh, so it's been quite a good uh, couple of years for uh, the Eurozone, actually, in growth terms. So average real GDP growth uh, of 2% in 2015, and last year estimated growth of 1.7%, uh, and that was against 1.2% in 2014, and before that, obviously, negative growth after the 2008 uh, uh, crash and the fallout from that. Now, of course, that hides some quite stark regional disparities which have persisted. Uh, uh, some countries, Greece of course, still struggling uh, to, to, to recover at all. Uh, others mired in stagnation, that's Italy. Uh, some uh, previous bailout countries, Ireland, Spain, are now uh, recovering. So in 2017 we expect average real GDP growth in the Eurozone of about 1.5%, which is probably closer to the kind of medium-term growth potential of the region. It's seven months since uh, the Brexit vote, and the impact on Europe's recovery has basically been barely noticeable. Uh, and of course, the UK economy itself has proved to be much more resilient than many of the doom mongers had uh, predicted. Uh, the UK economy grew by 2%. Uh, last year, and the Bank of England has now upped its forecast for 2017 to 2%. Uh, we're forecasting slightly slower growth than that because we think there will be an impact on household consumption of the uh, sterling uh, uh, crash and uh, also rising uh, inflation and obviously the uncertainty connected with the negotiations, which will start uh, uh, later this year uh, in the second quarter. Uh, the Brexit negotiations. So our forecast is for slightly gro slower growth uh, this year. Brexit aside, over the medium term, uh, the outlook for the single currency area uh, will remain pretty challenging because of basically because of demographic factors uh, exacerbating an already uh, 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 apparent um, competitiveness and uh, productivity. Uh, problem, uh, which means that over the long, medium and long term, actually the outlook, the growth outlook for this region is pretty gloomy and we should consider what the impact 
of that will be over successive electoral cycles on the political uh, landscape. Uh, in terms of risks um, to the outlook this year, um, well, there's a few internal risks. You know, we're still, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Brexit is still on the agenda. Um, our forecast is that Greece will leave the Eurozone at some point over the next uh, five years, and I can talk about why we think that later, if anybody wants uh, to know. There's obviously Italy um, is, uh, and the Italian banking sector um, is, is, is a risk to the Eurozone, but probably the main threats are external. And even here, two of the threats that people had been worried about at the end of, of last year are not really shaping up to be um, that serious. One is the uncertainty about the US monetary uh, policy uh, tightening, uh, and the second is uh, China and what's likely to happen in China, because that would have, obviously, a big impact uh, on, on, on the Eurozone. So uh, on monetary tightening in the US, um, really what we can see is that interest rates are not going to rise very quickly at all. Uh, we can see slow progress with the US Fed um, uh, so far in raising interest rates and the Bank of England and the Bank of Japan and the ECB are obviously behind uh, that. So QE is going to continue uh, in Europe for the foreseeable future. Um, the health of China's economy, uh, you know, the worry there is this massive debt accumulation, which is unsustainable in China, and when there will be a move to raise interest rates and, and tackle that problem. Uh, we're forecasting actually very reasonable growth of 6.2% in China, down from 6.7% last year. Uh, we think that the slowdown, and it will be a, slop, a sharp slowdown, will come in 2018, so after the uh, Politburo changes at the end of this year that we expect, then there'll be a move to, to tighten interest rates in 2018. So that will have a big impact, uh, especially on countries trading with China, Australia, um, Chile, and so on. Um, and, and that's actually a fairly upbeat forecast. Um, what would be pretty disastrous is if... Um, that isn't managed um, uh, in, 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 in policy terms. And um, uh, if there was failure of big banks in China, you know, that would have a major impact and uh, presage a global recession. Uh, there's some risk maybe from uh, the US administration's threats um, about um, an undervalued uh, euro. Um, you know, several Eurozone countries have significant trade exposure to the US. In fact, Germany's trade surplus with the US is bigger than that of Mexico. Uh, Donald Trump has already threatened to impose tariffs on German car makers. And if he were to follow up on this, uh, it would do significant damage to European exports. The EU as a whole ran a trade surplus with the US of about 103 billion US dollars in 2015. Uh, we don't think that we, we, we don't think that that is a uh, risk. I wouldn't put that risk above 50%. Uh, uh, um, there's a lot of talk, and we don't expect it to be followed through. Um, just finally, just a quick word about inflation. Um, yes, we actually have some inflation um, at the moment in, in the Eurozone, which is good news, though not if you look at the German media, of course. Uh, it's not good news at all. Uh, inflation reached a 42-month high of 1.9% in Germany in January, um, and that was all over the front pages. Um, and um, angst about inflation is always there under the surface in Germany, and so that's likely to encourage dissatisfaction with the ECB's loose monetary policy. Um, inflation in Germany is set to exceed 2% in coming months, However, we believe that despite pressure, political pressure coming from Germany to rein in QE policy, the ECB will resist that. At its meeting in January, the ECB made clear that it will look through the Q1 spike in inflation, which is largely um, a, a, a consequence of base effects, um, energy price base effects, um, because underlying price pressure does remain fairly weak within the Eurozone. So we expect a continuation of present policy. So um, that's just a quick look, really, at the um, 
economic outlook. But what I really want to then ask is where does this leave us? Will it help um, on the political uh, front? And uh, I think I've already said that I don't think uh, it will. And I only really want to make one point here. There's so many issues that I'm sure and questions that, that people have. But the point I want to make is do not overestimate the economic drivers of the contemporary popular or populist revolt in Europe or the US, which is not to say that they're not important, um, but I think you know, what has been neglected is the political um, issues. You know that old saying, uh, you know, Clinton, that it's the, it's the economy stupid. Well, actually, it's the politics stupid, and that's really what has been uh, neglected um, in, 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 in recent years, and I think that's why so many people got things wrong uh, last year. Now, in the latest edition of our annual democracy index, which I edit, I try to present a kind of multifaceted explanation of the Brexit and Trump phenomena uh, and this broader anti-establishment backlash that we're seeing across the continent, across Europe and um, in North America. I always argued against the view that this is simply a reaction to the fallout from the 208 global financial and economic uh, crisis and the austerity measures that followed uh, in Europe. I think its roots go much deeper and they go back before the crash. And we need to take uh, a broad view um, that takes in the impact of the end of the post-war boom in the 1970s, the collapse of communism and its impact on politics and parties and institutions in the West, uh, the transform transformation of uh, the traditional conservative or right-wing uh, Christian Democrat parties and on the left, the Social Democratic and Labour parties from the 1980s onwards, the increasingly technocratic nature of politics uh, and how politics is conducted, um, the erosion of representative democracy, which is expressed in some of the trends that uh, Lars was talking about um, in falling political participation, declining party membership, growing distrust of uh, institutions, governments, political parties. Um, those are all expressions of the, um, of, if not a complete breakdown, but certainly uh, a growing crisis of, of representative democracy, which we've been discussing for years in the Democracy Index. And that has now become manifest in this growing gap between political elites uh, and voters. Um, and the way that is increasingly expressed, what this divide is all about, actually, a lot of the time, people are just providing descriptions of the gap, i.e. these are low information voters, they're less educated, there's class divides, there's geographical divides, and so on. But what is being neglected is that this really is a gap in terms of values between political elites and electorates. Um, uh, you know, that is important. And unless you grasp that, um, the response is going to be inadequate. Um, and um, I think, you know, when we look at this whole discussion about post-truth, post-fact politics, that tells me that uh, lessons actually have not been learned uh, about what happened last year and that um, the true import of what happened has not been grasped and maybe we can come back to that. But the point is that these are not ephemeral events or reactions. They're not suddenly going to cease and politics is not going to go back to normal once the Eurozone recovery has gathered pace. Uh, in any case, uh, we shouldn't exaggerate. This recovery is from a very low base. Many countries have not returned even to the levels of the pre-crisis levels of 2007. And some, as I say, remain mired in crisis and uh, stagnation. Uh, and the long-term, medium and long-term outlook is hardly inspiring. So um, 
that can only exacerbate this political fragility over successive electoral cycles. I'll leave it there. So there's plenty of questions to ask about outcomes for this year.